Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, verses 11 and 12 is our text this evening. We begin reading in verse 1. Romans 11, 1, this is God's holy word. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says about the passage, uh, in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there's also come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if, it, but if it's, it's by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. What then? That which Israel is seeking for, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, the stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forever. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world, and their failure be riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? The reading of God's holy word. Be seated, please, and let's pray together. Our God, we look to you, and we look to your word, and we look to your spirit, and again request his help both in preaching and in hearing. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Children, have you ever dropped a rock in a pond or in a lake and seen the rings or the, the ripples in the water that travel outward, away from the point where you dropped that rock? It's what's called the ripple effect. The ripple effect describes a situation when something happens that makes other things happen. And what Paul's describing for us tonight in Romans 11, verses 11 and 12, is the ripple effect. It's, it's one event that causes a series of other events, other things to happen. God's hardening Israel in their unbelief causes the blessing of salvation to come to the Gentiles, which in turn makes the Jews jealous when they see that salvation in the Gentiles. And then it causes... Uh, the fulfillment of Israel, the fullness of Israel, and results in even greater blessing for the Gentiles, for the non-Jewish peoples. The theme of the whole chapter 11 is stated, as we noted last week in verse 2, where Paul says, God has not rejected his people, Israel. The chapter consists of two major parts, 1 through 10, 11 through 36. In verses 1 
through 10, Paul argues that God's rejection of Israel is not total, that he hasn't completely rejected his people whom he foreknew. He hasn't rejected them as a whole, and he, prevent, he presents a fourfold proof that we looked at last Lord's Day evening together, four proofs, four evidences that God has not rejected Israel. The, even though the majority of, of Israel had not believed, the testimony of Scripture proves that, is, that God had not rejected Israel. Paul's own Jewishness, having been uh, premier among the unbelieving Jews and having been chosen as the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, proves, supports his argument that God has not rejected the Gentiles. God's foreknowledge, his for loving of the people of Israel is an argument that he's not rejected his people. And then finally, the remnant, according to God's electing grace, proves that God has not rejected them. And then remember in verses 7 to 10, the apostle gives two Old Testament passages to demonstrate that notwithstanding even the level to which Israel's unbelief had risen, that this divine hardening in Israel wasn't God's last word to them. Paul's thesis in verse, uh, verses 11 through 36 of this uh, 11th chapter is that God's rejection of the Jews is not final. It's not total, verses 1 to 10. It's not final, verses 11 through 36. It was never God's purpose to cast off his people Israel as a whole, but by their unbelief, to cause the progress of the gospel uh, to, to be promoted among the Gentile people. Furthermore, that would in turn serve his purpose in the Jews as well. And both of these, these two things, not total but partial, not final but temporary, support Paul's emphatic assertion in verse 2 that God has not rejected his people, Israel. Now, is this just another matter for theologians to debate? Does this have any relevance to, to us whatsoever? Well, I contend with, to you that it does. That in the first place, it has to do with God's promises. If God promised that he would take a people Israel to himself and God's not a liar, then it has great relevance because it... it, it, it impinges upon us today as a church as to whether we can trust the veracity of God's promises to us. God's promises are true. So we can depend on those promises. But it's also significant because whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, Paul's argument has direct relevance to your own salvation and to your own Christian experience. And then Finally, and I've said this over and again, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll focus on this next week, next Lord's Day. Lord will. It affects the way we work. It affects the way we pray. I want to give you a very, um, I want to give you an illustration to, to prove that point next Lord's Day. And if I forget, you can remind me. God's purpose, Paul teaches, for hardening Israel is... Uh, for, for hardening them in their unbelief is not permanent rejection, but the Gentile salvation and Israel's restoration. God's purpose for hardening Israel in their unbelief is not their permanent rejection, but the Gentile salvation and Israel's restoration. To get at our theme tonight, the theme of our text, and children, if you're taking notes, you can, you can simply write, God's purpose for hardening Israel at the top of your page. God's purpose for hardening Israel. And we're going to say uh, something that is not the case for God's purpose in hardening Israel. And we're going to say something that is the case for God's purpose in hardening Israel. In the first place, God's purpose for Israel is not to reject them permanently, 
Secondly, it is to bring salvation to all nations through them. Not to reject them permanently, to bring salvation to all nations through them. So we think about this first aspect of the theme of our text. God's purpose in hardening his people Israel is not to reject them permanently. Now the form of the question in chapter 11, the question that Paul poses there is in the same form as in verse 1. Not chapter 11, verse 11. This, this, this question in verse 11 is the same, the same form of the question that he asks in verse 1, and it anticipates a negative answer. And this is the way that Paul argues his, his doctrine, we've said. We looked at a couple of instances of that in uh, chapter 6 in particular, or chapter 3, I believe it was, in particular. Uh, Paul asks a question. It's a question that expects a no. And then he answers that question emphatically. And he, he answers in, with the, the strongest form of the negative that's available to him in his language. May it never be. God forbid. We, uh, we, we might say, uh, don't even think about it. It's unthinkable that, that, that we would answer yes to this question. The key to understanding his argument is the meaning of these terms stumble and fall. He had introduced this term stumble at the end of chapter 9, where he writes that Israel stumbled over the stumbling stone. That's a quote from Isaiah chapter 8. And the stumbling stone is Christ. Israel had stumbled over the stumbling stone, and they had uh, their, their, their stumbling has to do then with their unbelief. The one who believes in Christ for righteousness will not be disappointed. That's what Paul says in, in chapter 9, verse 33 but, 33. but the Jews didn't believe in him. They instead pursued a righteousness by their own works. They sought a works-based righteousness instead of a faith-based righteousness. And that's what caused them to stumble. And that's, that's why God has rejected these, this unbelieving portion of Israel. That's what Paul means by their stumbling then. It's their, it's their rejection of Christ. And that brings us then to the question as to what it means that they would stumble so as to fall. Now, John Calvin says uh, that if you... Don't distinguish the way that Paul addresses sometimes individuals, individual Israelites, or groups of individuals in Israel, and Israel as a whole, you won't understand what, what Paul is saying here. So we need to, we need to differentiate. Uh, in one breath, Paul will say in this 11th chapter, Paul will refer to individuals, for example, in verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive, he's referring to the Gentiles there, but this reference to some of the branches broken off is a reference to individuals or a group of individuals within Israel. But then uh, he, he's referring in our text to Israel as a whole. And what he's arguing then is he's not denying that Many of the individuals who stumbled uh, did fall over the stumbling block Christ and to their destruction. Not denying that at all. He's rather denying that the Jews and they're stumbling over Christ as a people had not fallen permanently and irrecoverably, he argues forcibly that they did not. And so Paul's question, did the Jews stumble so as to fall, is equivalent to asking, was it God's purpose 
to harden Israel in their sin so that they would be cast off as a people. And his answer is emphatic. No, never unthinkable. The promise of salvation is to all peoples of the earth. But this promise always includes the continuance and fulfillment of God's saving purpose for Israel. The promise wasn't that God would forsake his people and in their place bring the Gentiles in, substitute other nations as the object of his love. The promise to Israel was that through her and not apart from her, salvation would be extended to all people. And Paul goes on to argue then that this is the design even of their stumbling over Christ was to bring salvation to the nations. God's purpose for hardening Israel is not in the first place to reject them permanently. Secondly, God's purpose for Israel is to bring salvation to all nations through them. God has a saving purpose for Israel's transgression. That's what Paul says here. He speaks of their transgression in verse 12 and the saving ramifications of that transgression. And here's where we come to uh, the ripple effect and And here's that ripple effect. There's Israel's transgression. There is salvation to the Gentiles. There's the jealousy of the Jews. There's the fulfillment of Israel. And then greater blessings for the Gentiles. Israel's transgression is designed to promote the salvation of the Gentiles. Now, that's uh, this is the beginning point. This is the, the rock dropped into the water is Israel's transgression and Outward in those concentric circles from the point where the the rock is dropped, those are uh, the the ripples, the, the effects of Israel's transgression. And the first effect is that salvation comes to the Gentiles. Israel's transgression is the equivalent of their stumbling, which is their rejection of Christ as Messiah, Christ as their Savior. That was their trespass and And it's by this that salvation comes to the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Now, Jesus predicted this in his interaction with the Jews after he had taught the parable of the landowner, Matthew 21, from which the Jews had drawn the proper conclusion that, that the wicked vine growers, to whom the owner had rented out the vineyard, and who instead of giving him the proceeds of the vineyard, killed his servants and his son, the heir, should be destroyed. And the vineyard rented to others who would bring the proceeds to the owner at the proper time. And Jesus said to them, in effect, I am that son, I am that heir, You have rejected me, and that's to your destruction. He quotes Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. And then he said to them, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And that's a reference to the salvation that comes to the Gentiles as a consequence of Israel's transgression. Now we see this taking shape in Acts chapter 13. Paul's on his first missionary journey. He and Barnabas were in the synagogue at at Antioch in Pisidia. The whole city was assembled at the synagogue to hear Paul preach, but the Jews were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict Paul and to blaspheme. And Paul and Barnabas respond in uh, verse 46 and 
they say it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. What Paul is speaking about here in Romans chapter 11 is taking shape now in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 13. For he goes on, thus the Lord has commanded us, I place you as a light for the Gentiles, that you should bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorified the, the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And when those many who had been appointed to eternal life believed, that's this determination on God's part to bring salvation to the Gentiles to the transgression of Israel. Now, the Old Testament is primarily about Israel. It's primarily about the people, Israel. It's primarily about the, the Jews. There's very little attention given to, to Gentiles except when they come in contact with the people of Israel. And as the, the, this idea of salvation to the Gentiles is foreshadowed, How then did the Gentiles or the, the non-Jews come to the blessing of salvation? Paul answers that for us here. Their transgression. God's hardening them in their transgression is designed to bring the Gentiles into the church. In other words, what's happened, what, 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 what would happen, what happened in, in Acts chapter 13, which was the beginning of, of, of the ripple effect that moved outward from there is a part of God's decree of salvation. And God is saying, this is the bigger picture. This is my greater picture. This is what I, this is what I intended for the hardening of Israel in their transgression. And most Christians today including most, if not all, of you, are Gentiles. We're not Jews by descent. And we're told here how that came about. How it is that, that our salvation came about. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, this is how your salvation came about. It came about because of the rock. That was dropped into the lake. And the ripple effect that took place. God determined to bring salvation. To the non-Jews. So there's a sense. In which you and I. Are indebted. To the Jews. For our salvation. The apostle goes on to remind the Gentiles of this in verses 17 and 18. And he tells them, don't be arrogant. So you were grafted in. You're a wild olive branch. You were grafted into the branch. But don't be arrogant about that. Don't be boastful about that. It's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. Israel is the root. But the way Paul constructs the last sentence of, of verse 11 here indicates that the, the salvation of the Gentiles is, is subordinate to another purpose. Israel's transgression, which results in the salvation of the Gentiles, is designed to make the Jews themselves jealous. That's the next ripple in this series of ripple effects. Israel's transgression, salvation to the Gentiles, the jealousy of the Jews. Now, Paul had already alluded to this in chapter 10 and verse 19, and we dealt with this some weeks ago. He says, using another one of these questions, 
he's so famous for, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? And then he quotes a passage from Deuteronomy, which says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And so what Paul is saying is that to some degree, Israel did know. They knew something about what was coming. There were enough foreshadowings in the Old Testament revelation that they knew that something was coming down the pike with regard to the Gentile nations. God's design was that when Israel, the, the people that God had chosen for and taken for himself as his own people, his special possession, when they saw others made recipients of God's grace and his mercy, that they would see what they were missing and that they would long for the Messiah that they had rejected. He's not devaluating the Gentiles' Salvation. He goes on to remark here in verse 12 how, how rich that salvation is. If their transgression is riches for the world, he says. Riches for the Gentiles, he says. But what's striking is that their salvation, and that means your salvation, is subordinate to to God's saving purpose in Israel. Israel's faith is, des is designed to promote the, the salvation of the Gentiles, but the salvation of the Gentiles isn't designed to be destructive to Israel as a people. It's not to be damaging to Israel's salvation. It's designed to promote Israel's salvation by making them jealous. And the paradox here the, the seemingly contradictory circumstance is that Israel's unbelief has the purpose of restoring their faith, which leaves us already anticipating Paul's doxology in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable are his ways. Now note well here that Paul, just as he did earlier in the ninth chapter, makes an ethnic distinction between Israel and the Gentile nations, which precludes the objection that God's saving purpose does not include Israel as an ethnic entity, which is the argument of some, that God has no purpose any longer. God no longer regards Israel as an ethnic entity. It's true that with respect to Christ, Christ's accomplishment, there's no longer Jew or Gentile, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the promise of the gospel in Christ. But from Paul's teaching here, it simply doesn't follow that God's people Israel no longer fulfill a particular function in God's worldwide saving purpose. In fact, Israel's fulfillment, Paul goes on to say, will lead to even greater blessing for the Gentiles. And that's the next ripple in the series of ripples. Israel's transgression, salvation to the Gentiles, the Jews' jealousy, and Israel's fulfillment here in verse 12. How much more will their fulfillment be? Paul asks. Verse 12 begins an argument from the greater to the lesser. If this, how much more that? That's what Paul is saying here in verse 12. And the point of the how much more argument is that even greater blessing will come to the Gentile through Israel's faith and restoration than by their hardening and unbelief. 
riches for the world. That's, that's what Paul says, riches for the world. And, and, and it describes the salvation that has come to the Gentiles by Israel's trespass. And these are synonymous terms, the world and the Gentiles. World emphasizes the, the ethnic diversity among the non-Jews. Israel's transgression, verse 12, is their rejection of Christ, and their failure or their loss is the resulting tearing away from the kingdom uh, uh, of the kingdom from them that, that Christ predicted there in the parable of the landowner. So Israel's transgression, the rejection of Christ, and Israel's loss of the kingdom meant that the riches of salvation would be lavished upon the world of the Gentiles. But then comes the how much more. And the how much more is Israel's fulfillment. Now what's meant by their fulfillment? What's meant by their fullness? What's meant by their inclusion? It's contrasted with their trespass of rejecting Christ and the loss of the kingdom. So the fullness that Paul has in mind or the fulfillment that Paul has in mind for Israel is embracing Christ and the restoration of Israel to the kingdom. Just as the majority of Israel had been marked by unbelief, trespass, and loss in their fullness, the majority would be marked by faith in Christ and having the blessing of their inheritance in the kingdom restored. But at this point the, the, in the argument, in, the, in Paul's argument, the focus isn't on the blessing that accrues to Israel in their fullness. It's rather the greater blessing that will accrue to the Gentiles from Israel's fulfillment. That's the final ripple in the pond. If Israel's rejection of Christ and having the kingdom ripped away from them meant riches for the Gentiles, how much greater would those riches be to them in terms of their salvation in Israel's fulfillment? In their fullness. So the theme of verses 11 and 12. Is the salvation of the Gentiles. The, the riches bestowed upon the Gentiles by Israel's unbelief. With a promise of even greater blessings that would come to the Gentiles. As a consequence of Israel's fulfillment of their fullness. And that's the full ripple effect then. Israel stumbles over Christ and they're hardened in their unbelief. Salvation comes to the Gentiles. Israel is made jealous. God's salvation is fulfilled in Israel and an even greater blessing comes to the Gentiles. I urge you as you think about this not to see whether it fits into a particular scheme of millennialism. Rather, look at what the text says on the face of it. Let me put it another way. Don't, don't reject this understanding simply because it doesn't fit into your favorite scheme of eschatology or uh, the end times. The, the pre-mill, the amill, and the post-mill labels are Helpful in some ways, but in some ways they're confusing and they're not helpful at all. Doesn't mean you shouldn't study the end times. Doesn't mean you shouldn't study eschatology. You should. It's important. Simply means we shouldn't try to stuff what Paul says into one particular eschatological scheme or another. God's purpose for hardening Israel in their unbelief is not their permanent rejection, but the Gentile salvation and Israel's restoration. Two things important for us. First is, be informed and not ignorant about Israel's role in the Bible. 
Our text has to do with Israel's spiritual status and not their earthly status. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Israel's statehood, nothing to do with geographical boundaries, nothing to do with the future built, rebuilding of a temple in Jerusalem and a return to Jewish sacrifices. Nothing could be more contradictory to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and Old Testament sacrifices than to rebuild the temple and the altar and sacrifice sacrifices on it. It has nothing to do with political ramifications of Israel as an ally to the United States. Nothing to do with the United States president recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel as apparently some evangelical Christians seem to believe is another step toward the fulfillment of prophecy. It has to do with God's revelation through Paul that he's not finished with his people, the Jews, that there is a future blessing in store for God's people, Israel. You see how radical different, radically different that is than the false notion that God offered salvation to the Jews, the Jews rejected it, and so he turned to the non-Jews and offered it to them. Be informed, not ignorant, about Israel's role in the Bible. But then secondly, be humble and not arrogant toward Israel. In light of what Paul says about Israel, in fact, in light of what we read about Israel in the Old Testament, when they so often disobeyed God and were so hard in their sins. It's tempting for us to be arrogant and boastful about our salvation. But remember that Paul goes on, as we've said, to warn the Gentiles. Don't do that. Don't be arrogant. The only thing that separates you and Israel you and the Jews hardened in their sins is the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. Furthermore, God, Paul teaches us here, is not finished with Israel, his people. All Israel will be saved. That's what he said. We'll leave it to next week, Lord willing, to discover what the meaning of that glorious phrase is. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are a great God. Indeed, O oh Lord, the depths of the riches, both of your wisdom and understanding how unsearchable are your judgments, how unfathomable are your ways. We can't search them out. We can't understand them fully, but what we can, O oh Lord, we desire to do, and so continue to give us insight into your word as we uh, consider the final section of, this, uh, of our time together here in Romans chapter 11. If you're willing, we ask in Christ's name, amen.